Okay, so next up is Harriet Noon from UC Davis um, talking about the Earth and Biogeodome project. Short and sweet. Okay. <clears throat> So thanks a lot. I wanted to thank Roderick, he's not here, and the organizers for um, inviting me to, to talk today. Uh, yesterday was really interesting for me. I'm not a methods developer. I'm a biologist, genomicist. And uh, so it's, it was really enlightening yesterday to hear uh, many of your comments. So today, at Roderick's request, I'm going to have a Try to do three talks in, in one. I'll probably run out of time. Uh, the three parts are to give you a, a brief infomercial, science free infomercial on the Earth Biogenome Project, because I think the project is going to provide you with infinite, infinite amounts of data to compute and to, to, to look at interesting problems. And then I'm going to draw on uh, why high contiguity assemblies, the kinds of reference genomes that we're producing in the Earth Biogenome Project are use, very useful. I'm gonna show you uh, some examples from our own work, work on chromosome evolution. And then hopefully I'll get to the last part and I'll talk about some of the scientific, technical and computational challenges uh, that we're gonna face in a project of this scale. So what is the Earth Biogenome Project? Um, Earth Biogenome Project is organized it's as a global network of networks that uh, has a common goal of sequencing all 1.8 million uh, known eukaryotic species in a period of 10 years. So it's a pretty ambitious project. And uh, we, we published the manifesto, uh, if you will, on this project in 2018. In, uh, in PNAS, it's cited there uh, at the bottom. Um, myself, uh, Gene Robinson from the University of Illinois, uh, John Kress from the Smithsonian are the co-founders of this project. And now this project has grown to uh, encompass more than 5,000 uh, scientists from around the world. And I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, the project officially launched two years ago in London at the Wellcome Trust. And, um, and since then we have been making uh, tr really steady progress on, the, on these goals. And I'm going to tell you about what we've been able to accomplish uh, in the last couple of years. Um, so uh, one of the goals, I think you can all relate to this slide is to create a digital repository of all eukaryotic uh, life on earth, which we feel will be the foundation, sort of an, it's an infrastructure project, if you will, for the future of biology and the future of the bioeconomy, global bio, global bioeconomy. And um, so the, this digital repository uh, of annotated 1.8 million uh, annotated genomes is going to be exascale in, in terms of the data storage requirements just for the genomes alone. Uh, and most of the biocomputational tools that we have available today for comparative analysis at that scale are either inadequate or they don't exist. Uh, so we're gonna discuss those, some of those problems and challenges uh, at the end later in the talk. Okay, so why do this? Uh, why even think about sequencing all eukaryotes? Well. Uh, this digital repository of life will allow us to address uh, many fundamentally important questions in biology. Uh, and we've heard a smattering of those uh, from the speakers uh, yesterday and today from accurate phylogenies to gaining a comprehensive understanding of genome evolution, the origins of eukaryotic species, speciation processes, and understanding all the way up to understanding the composition and functioning of complete ecosystems. Uh, this kind of knowledge will be essential for synthetic biology of the future and applications uh, of an, in adaptive agriculture, in human medicine, conservation biology, and in mitigating the effects of climate change. 
And so what is the Earth Biogenome Project? How exactly is it organized? And, um, and uh, so, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's a confederated international network of networks. There are now 43 member institutions, 50 affiliated projects that have uh, signed on to the Memor Memorandum of Understanding, more than 5,000 participants around the world in uh, 22 countries where the affiliated projects are located, but there are participants in these affiliated projects in more than 100 countries around around. It's about half the countries in the world are already uh, participating. So the Earth Biogenome Project is now a very large and diverse and inclusive organization uh, that strives to be a model uh, for large scale scientific collaborations and providing equal opportunities for all people everywhere to participate in this, um, in this endeavor. Uh, you know, recently, we added uh, one project in the last year, the Africa Biogenome Project here, I won't do it here. That one alone has 22 different countries. There was a nice article in Nature uh, just a couple of months ago about this project. And um, the members of, of the EBP are committed to developing standards. So you see the glob global hub and spoke uh, model. Uh, on the outside are the centers that are doing the sequencing and anal uh, uh, analysis. On the inside and the red circles are uh, taxon specific communities. And the center is the coordinating body, which is the, you know, what we're calling the Earth Biogenome Project. And the secretariat for the Earth Biogenome Project resides at UC Davis. And, um, and I chair the, the working group. I have the honor and privilege of representing all of these people. Uh, around the world, and it has been uh, quite a ride so far. Um, and so I mentioned the, the hub and spoke uh, model and uh, the importance of standards. And, um, and in addition to the importance of standards, which I'll discuss in, in a moment, the project also has a, an ethical, legal, and social issues committee and a justice, equity, inclusion, diversity, and inclusion group, two committees uh, uh, that are, uh, that have created guidelines and principles for us uh, that, uh, that we have open access to all the data that, that is produced and all in compliance with um, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Goya protocols around access and benefit sharing. And I say this because this is a particularly difficult problem that we face in this project. And that's, it's not the sequencing and it's not the assembly. We have the technology actually to do this today if we had enough money. Uh, the problem is acquiring the samples uh, under the convention and ensuring uh, access. To get access, you have to uh, actually guarantee benefits. It's uh, no access, no benefits. And of course, there's no benefits if you can't have access. And so it's one of the, the big problems uh, that we face. And, uh, and again, uh, we want to do this in an open, inclusive way. Uh, and, and one of the ways that we're, we're doing this is building capacity uh, around the world in different places so that um, uh, many different locations around the world can contribute by sequencing, assembling, and analyzing the genomes from their own biodiversity. And so there's a lot of very serious people. Some of these people's names you'll, you'll recognize uh, right, away, right away. Federica de Palma uh, is the chair of the International Science Committee. She was at the Earlham Institute. She was at the Broad at, for some time under, with Eric Lander. She's now at uh, executive director of, uh, I think, Genome uh, British Columbia. Uh, Mara is a uh, UC Davis grad who's been at the Sanger for some time. Richard Durbin is the chair of our sequencing assembly group. He'd be known to most of you probably. Paul Felicek uh, from EBI is uh, chair of our annotation subcommittee. Uh, Justin Limblateau from Uppsala and, and the Broad is uh, our chair for our analysis uh, subgroup. And Xiaofeng Wei from BGI, who's uh, one of their leaders at the China National Gene Bank is the chair of the IT and informatics group. It's a very serious group and um, the reports from each of these committees is available on the EBP website. So all of the recommendations for 
uh, everything from sample collection and processing and uh, sequencing and assembly uh, are all uh, outlined in a series of reports uh, that you can download, read and download. Now, what about the strategy? It's just now we're gonna sequence uh, 1.8 million species. How are we going to do this? Uh, we're gonna do it in three phases. Uh, the first phase will be to sequence a representative species of all taxonomic uh, families. There are about 9,600 families uh, in all, and that will be done uh, to reference quality. Uh, and uh, that's shifting what that means, but um, uh, we describe in detail what we mean by reference quality uh, in, in, in our papers. Right now, a reference quality genome uh, uh, for, for your average eukaryote is probably costing around seven or eight thousand uh, dollars. And that the only thing we need to do, we've now reduced the process from five steps and five different technologies to two, kind of goes to the questions <laughs> that were being brought up yesterday about developing methodologies. We have people who worked on that pipeline, original pipeline. Well, it's down to two technologies now, uh, you know, high C and uh, long reads, uh, pack bio uh, long reads. And uh, that's really all you need to get to reach the metrics that the project has uh, set for uh, assemblies. Uh, phase one, 90, about 9,600. Phase two, an increase in 14-fold uh, uh, output uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we got to get to uh, in four years to do about 119,000 uh, genomes. Uh, these numbers depend on whose taxonomy you use. Taxonomy is a very <laughs> inexact uh, thing. There are different taxonomies. The number in parenthesis is NCBI. So NCBI has 119,000 genera and, uh, and 1.5 million species in the out years, uh, uh, the last few years uh, of the project, if we are successful. And um, this uh, I'll tell, talk about what it will cost. That's the phylogenomic wave strategy, just to simply collect, go through uh, first family, then gender and species. But the reality is that people are getting money to do different parts of these projects, some that are involved in conservation work, others that are involved in ecosystem work. And so a second strategy, which we call the Google Life strategy, deals with location sampling, uh, or sampling all species in a particular geographical area, such as biodiversity hotspots. Uh, there's a long-term uh, ecological uh, monitoring program that are funded by the NSF, for example, Wytham Woods, uh, which is uh, um, very close to Oxford uh, and was purchased actually by Oxford. It's been under continuous uh, evaluation since the 1940s, for example. They have over 500 animals be 800 uh, uh, moths, for example, 500 plants and so on. And they really know a lot about these, um, about these um, locations. And so the idea would be to sequence everything. Darwin Tree of Life project, which is run out of the Sanger, has uh, the goal of sequencing all biodiversity in the UK and Ireland. That's about 62,000 species in all. And they have funding from uh, the Wellcome Trust and have begun uh, really working through their pilot phase now and it's coming along. Uh, they're the major contributor right now to, uh, to genomes. And all of this, you know, for all of you models, you know, you can model at the cell level or you can model at the, uh, at the ecosystem level. Um, you know, the idea is if you're looking at ecosystems is to build models that can produce uh, a multidimensional and dynamic view of how uh, populations, how change uh, or species can, can, can change uh, in response to changes in environmental conditions such as um, climate change. And all of this can be done and the numbers actually have gotten better over time, but the original estimates that all of this uh, would, would cost about $4.7 billion. Uh, that was of a couple of years ago, and if you convert the money that was spent on the Human Genome Project, the off-sided number is $3 billion, right, to sequence the human genome. In 2003, you can sequence all of eukaryotic life on Earth today for less than the cost that it was for the human genome. And if you 
try and do the benefits, you know, you, you look there, depending on the reports, anywhere from 360 billion a year to a trillion uh, in return on investment. That's just for one genome, the human genome. Uh, and, uh, and today, uh, with, with what we're facing in, in, in climate change, uh, for example, um, yeah, bioenergy production, agriculture, adaptation of our important agricultural species of crops and animals, um, you know, the return on investment is likely to really be much higher. And, I, and biologists don't think in these terms, you know, you think of your little R01 or your NSF grant and such, and you're very happy. But, you know, we're on a campus where big science was practically invented here, you know. And uh, if you look at the cost, for example, uh, the cost of the, the web telescope that was just put up, right? took 20 years and the cost was $10 billion. Okay. And uh, I'm not here to diss my colleagues up on the hill or anything, but I say, you know, the value, what is the comparative value, you know, of sequencing all of life on earth versus, you know, uh, looking out in the heavens, understanding the origins of the universe. I mean, there's just so much that we're going to be gained in terms of knowledge and in terms of benefit from doing this, that it's kind of a no brainer. It's just that we don't have the kind of political power that the physicists have, you know, our colleagues in the, in the physical sciences have, but we're, we're getting there, we're making uh, inroads and it's gonna be uh, very interesting to see how this um, plays out. But it's 4.7 billion over the entire world. You know, It's not a lot of money over 10 years or 15 years, or however long it takes. It's gonna get done eventually. and. Uh, that's what's, um, that's what's important. It's who's gonna play the major role in leading it. That is um, sort of up for grabs, I guess. And so uh, what progress has been made um, so far? I'll try and run through this pretty quickly uh, because of time issues. Um, uh, this is the world status. These are, we have a, a great team at the Sanger Institute called the GOAT team. And the GOAT team has created a fantastic uh, tool for uh, collecting metadata on all of the assemblies. And um, we have very nice ways of producing summary charts. These are available on the Earth Biogenome Project website. This is everyone, not just the Earth Biogenome Project participants, but this is the current status. And I'll just point to this number right down here, uh, which is, uh, you know, everything we know right now in terms of, you know, what we've been able to derive from genome biology is from you know, less than 1% of known eukaryotic life. And what's unknown is probably 10 times of what we know, okay? So uh, that's it. That's what's, what's known. Even at the phylum level, you know, depending on whose taxonomy you use, uh, 67 at NCBI, not a single representative species from all known phyla. And part of that is because some of the phyla are, you know, they're, they're, minor, they're single cell eukaryotes. You can't do assemblies yet very well with single cell uh, organisms that can't be cultured. And so uh, part of the challenge, I really love uh, Sundas's talk because another great application will be doing uh, kind of assemblies on these single cell eukaryotes, mixing short read data, maybe with high C data and getting a reasonable approximation of what the chromosome organization and structure might be. So um, this is what EBP has, has been able to do of these totals so far in a very short period of time. And we're really focusing, remember, at the family level, which is here. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, at the family level, EBP is starting to make a major contribution, but as I'll show you in a moment, uh, it's really the quality of these genomes. Here is all different qualities from content, highly fragmented with hundreds of thousands of contigs all the way to telomere to telomere genomes are included here. But they, those are not going to be what we want. We, 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 don't, we want to have a reference quality genome for at least at the family level, if not um, for each species. Uh, I mentioned the, the GOAT team. I'll have to go quickly here. There are many different features of this GOAT uh, tool. One is at the ordinal level, you can search and see if an organism, uh, a uh, representative uh, species from any order has been sequenced. And um, then there are these summary charts. Uh, and this summarizes the activity for EBP progress. You know, we're starting to double. This is just the first six months of this year. The colors indicate the, the green color 
are uh, these uh, chromosome scale uh, assemblies, most of which meet the EBP reference, EBP uh, standards. The blue are scaffold assemblies. You can see we're really switching into uh, chromosome scale uh, assemblies now. And uh, the numbers are growing very quickly. This is uh, species and this is uh, families. And, uh, and so progress is being made, but I think our most important contributions of the affiliated projects across the world is in the production of these really high quality genomes. So if you look at those that meet the standard, just take a very simple set of metrics, which would be one, uh, a, a, a contig N50 of one megabase and scaffold N50 of 10 megabases and you just use that as a, as a simple metric for a high quality genome, there are only 1,316 of those 10,000 genomes that were in INSDC databases. There's only 1,000 of the uh, 1,300 of those that meet even this criteria. And of those, 41% uh, are from EBP affiliated projects. And I'm telling you right now, this is a big underestimate because we have 50 projects but only 25 of the projects are in the GOAT system. Two of the really big projects, one which is not located not far from here at JGI on Fungi has a hundred families done at reference quality. Um, and then uh, BGI's data is not yet integrated in there either. So these are underestimates of the uh, contribution of EBP to these high quality reference genomes. If you look at the family level already, 56 per nearly 56% of the genomes are coming from EBP affiliated projects, which is uh, uh, of these really high quality reference quality genomes coming from EBP. So that's really, uh, really great. Um, I'm going to have to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. The, there have been lots of papers already. The first 16 genomes in 2021 uh, look in most of the problems that were looked at were very, very specific. There were a series of uh, 10 papers here, a couple related to conservation. Um, uh, another one of the affiliated projects is uh, Zoonomia. Katie's uh, involved in this project. Uh, it's uh, headed by Eleanor Carlson and Justin Lynn Blateau. They have a series of 10 papers. Uh, I guess we have a series of 10 papers coming out in science in the next uh, couple of months. So all the revisions are being returned on the actual, uh, really uh, actual science involved with this first set, this what they call the marker paper. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a really exciting group of papers. One is, you know, the applications around conservation, even individual genomes can be very useful in predicting threatened species based on runs of homozygosity and overall heterozygosity. And, um, wow, I went the wrong way here. And um, again, this is a project that Katie was involved in and one of her former students, Kathleen Keogh Graham Hughes. This happened during the pandemic, okay? And I was in the shower one morning saying, how could we use the, have to do something to help solve this problem. So I, I said, why don't we look at, at ACE2? Uh, and it so happened that there, you know, the ACE2 is the, is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. And there happened to be 410 vertebrate species with uh, ACE2 receptors in the, in the database. And um, well, I don't have a lot of time to go through this because we looked at uh, you know, uh, regions of the molecule that had uh, undergone accelerated evolution and um, selection and developed an index based on similarity to the contact residues at, uh, for, for the spike protein. And we were able to make predictions about which species uh, might be susceptible, sort of a first pass, very low tech uh, effort uh, to get at which species might be the intermediate host, an issue that's still not resolved, whether this virus jumped directly from bats to humans or whether uh, it went through an intermediate species or possibly was even engineered in a laboratory. None of these hypotheses have been uh, completely excluded. But we made some predictions that people said, oh, no, well, you know, here very high, it turned out that all the contact residues between humans and the great apes were conserved. Every one of the, the, the contact residues said, yep, they were going to be susceptible. And sure enough, within a few weeks, the first case at San Diego Zoo of transmission to gorilla came up. And then this one went until last year. It said, oh, 
hi, you know, this is from a completely different clade, right? These are from, these are Laurie's Ethereans, these are, are you are Conigliars. And then, you know, white deer, this was one of the highest uh, in the high category in terms of its potential risk for binding for, of the spike protein. And of course, you know the story, white-tailed deer are a major <laughs> reservoir. We didn't get them all right, but for a first pass, it was really uh, showed the tremendous utility of having uh, these kinds of data. Now, I did want to spend a lot of time talking about this, but um, I don't have that much time. Uh, this, these, this work that we've been doing for more, almost 20 years now on ancestral reconstruction uh, has really been enabled by having these reference quality genomes. And we've been very interested in what the karyotype and genome organization was of the ancestral mammal and what the role of chromosome rearrangements uh, really is in, in speciation adaptation and the development of disease. And as I mentioned, we started this uh, nearly 20 years ago, big collaborative studies. I talked about modeling good behavior for collaborations. This was a, a great one started between my lab and Steve O'Brien's lab uh, when Bill Murphy was still a postdoc there and my former postdoc, Dennis Larkin and graduate students, Annalee Everts. Vanderwen, this was a time when there were only the human mouse and rat were sequenced and we had to figure out how to use maps to, uh, to reconstruct ancestral genomes using the algorithms that were developed by Pavel Pevsner and Glenn Tesla. A real interdisciplinary collaboration in these colored regions represent ancestral fragments that are overlaid onto the human genome. Well, this new study now, we've got a representative from every mammalian order, each of the mammalian orders, sorry, and um, most of those are very high quality. The minimum uh, N50, scaffold N50 is 14 megabases, 13 of these assemblies of chromosome level, 24 out of the 27 orders of mammals uh, and, um, and with, with two outgroup species. And we use this algorithm called the Scrambler, which was developed with Jen Ma. We shared a, a postdoc when he was at uh, Illinois, Jay Boon Kim. And uh, we use some of Jian's um, uh, algorithms that we developed earlier for doing reference assisted chromosome assembly to descramble. This is to, to uh, be able to reconstruct the ancestor from the syntenic fragments that we could identify in extant genome. So this is kind of how descrambler works. Um, we can talk about it. It uses uh, pairwise alignment. Lassie alignments identifies syntenic fragments between the reference genome and the extant genomes you're comparing it to, and then uses phylogenetic information as well as outgroup information to determine what, uh, it's a probabilistic model, what the likely adjacencies are between the syntenic fragments in the ancestor, and then it uses a greedy algorithm to, to sort of order and rank these and pull these out. And that's kind of how Descrambler works. And this is what we've been able to, to do now. This is just the lineage leading to human. These are eight uh, different ancestors. So these complete reconstruction of the mammalian ancestor at very high resolution. And all the steps, inversions, fissions, fusions from each step from the ancestral mammal to the therian, the eutherian, the boreutherian, all the way to human, but we also did three independent reconstructions to look for biases using a reference from three different lineages. And so the eukaryotic genome, the uh, mammalian genomes that we see today are just really uh, a mosaic of 2,557 syntenic fragments that are about 800 KB in size. And these are the building blocks are just switched in order. These are the building blocks of all uh, all genomes. I'll have to skip this is fascinating uh, about how this reconstruction relates to the reconstructed amniote and the reconstructed aves, but uh, several of these chromosomes, nine of the chromosomes uh, actually are uh, equivalent, one-to-one -one equivalents of, of chicken chromosomes in the ancestral mammal, separated by 130 million years of evolution. We can see conserved segments over 318 million years of amniote evolution. And within those segments say, well, why are they conserved? Well, we have conserved functions. Uh, you know, this is uh, what you get when you do a go analysis and you see these conserved blocks have enrichment for genes that are related to development. And it makes a lot of sense. You don't break these blocks. If you do break them, you're basically breaking 
the body plan, the normal development of these organisms. Whereas the breakpoint regions between the blocks are highly dynamic, have lots of novel genes, zinc finger proteins, other rapidly evolving genes related to sensory reception in the environment. So I have like a minute. And uh, we have a, a story about TADS, which I'd love to tell you, but I don't have time. And overall, chromatin architecture that uh, we showed in, in a paper just this year, a postdoc in my lab, can serve for 54 million years. You can look at these high sea maps, and even though, say, the dingo and the puma, these are, you know, this is the Felidae, the Canidae, and the Ursidae, here you have th uh, two fissions that broke this ancestral chromosome that you find in cats into three different chromosomes, but the high C maps are identical and the eigenvectors. This is what you get if you can standardize all done from the same tissue, all done from lymphocytes and all done in the same lab, Erez Lieberman's lab, this is all from DNA Zoo. And so we've been able to show that chromatin structure is also uh, highly conserved. And um, I'll just end, uh, like I said, I, I had a feeling I'd run out of time here, that there are numerous computational challenges. We can discuss these uh, if we have time. We've got to go from 9,300 genomes uh, to uh, uh, rather nine genomes a day, which we have basically achieved the capacity for in the world in phase two to 123 genomes a day, and eventually to uh, 1,200 a day if we're going to do this in a few years, so huge technical and computational challenges. The computational challenges are bolded here and have been mentioned by several people already. Uh, uh, Tandy talked uh, about resolving phylogenetic relationships. This is the biggest problem uh, that we face, uh, which is doing whole genome alignments at scale uh, and uh, annotation at scale. That was mentioned uh, also yesterday by Anna, uh, I believe. And, um, and, and of course, uh, the analysis tools. If you're interested in this, there's 10 papers published in a special issue in PNAS just earlier in the year. Uh, that, uh, that's the cover. And I just wanted to thank my co-chairs, John and Jean, and the other committee chairs, uh, Hank Greeley here at Stanford, who's chair of the LC committee, Melissa, who's at George Washington University. I mentioned Federica before, Sadie and Marcella. Sadie's at Rockefeller, Marcella's at, um, at uh, Sanger and Nicolette uh, and the folks from my lab, uh, two recent postdocs uh, in the lab and the Chromosome Evolution Working Group, Zoonomia Consortium and all these folks. These are really big collaborations with a lot of people spending uh, a lot of time on uh, working together on important problems. I'll just close by saying one problem, you know, what practical problem, you know, would genome reconstruction uh, solve? And so it was very interesting. Joanna just took a job at Colossal, you know. <laughs> so Colossal is George Church's company who's involved in de-extinction. De and of course, they realized that, hey, if we're going to de-extinct species, maybe it would be a good idea to understand what the reconstructed genome might have looked like before we tried to de-extinct it. So uh, she actually got a really interesting job. <laughs> so thanks a lot. I'm sorry I ran a couple, two minutes over here, and we don't have time for questions, I guess, but I'm going to be here. Maybe, we'll Maybe one or questions. two. Okay. Thanks a lot, folks. Sorry. That's what you get when you try to give three seminars in one. <laughs> it was a great time. Uh, My fault. I just had a quick question about uh, how well the assemblies like reflect the actual raw reads. So, for example, if you remap, how, what is your remapping fraction? So um, the assemblies are based, you know, today's assemblies are based on, you know, mostly a single individual and long reads and the scaffolding is done uh, with high C. And uh, in addition to the, to, the, to the scaffolding, we also have, you know, QV is part of that. So we use QV40. The assemblies that we're producing now are haplotype. They're all phased assemblies. One of those assemblies, so it's like two assemblies per individual. One of the assemblies is, uh, is um, usually very good and the other one is not that great. And they're all filtered. So if you're saying what are the contaminants, how that might, if that's what, what your question is, uh, there are uh, decontamination uh, 
pipe decontamination as part of the current pipeline. So we take out, you know, we found sequences from plants and mammal species, all kinds of bad contamination issues. And that's now taken care of in, in the pipeline. So uh, I think uh, something like 90, we have to have at least 95% of the reeds mapping back to the assembly or something like that. It's pretty high. You know, the, the yeah. Is that, yeah, okay. Other questions? We have a minute, maybe not. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Next up we have,